fix that. Okay. There's a say, it, say it loudly, Judy. How do you know that God is real? Because God lives inside of you. How do I know that God is real? Because He lives in me. And it has to show. The greatest cause of unbelief is not atheism. It is Christians. Now, I'm giving you a quote from a man that lived in the 1930s. Okay? The greatest cause of unbelief in the world today is Christians who come to church on Sunday and go out and live like the devil on Monday. Okay? That is the greatest cause of unbelief in the world today. So as Judy said, how do you know that God is real? Because He's got to live inside of you and He's got to make a difference in your life that you could never make yourself. Right? If I can fabricate all this stuff myself, then I don't need God. But I can't change my nature. Right? It's like the frog, the big frog, who was in a pool. The scorpion came to the edge of the water, asked the frog to take him to the other side of the pond. Because scorpions can't swim. Right? The frog said, no, you're a scorpion. You'll get on my back and you'll sting me. Because listen, I've got to get to the other side. I promise you, I will not sting you. Frog said, I don't believe you, you're a scorpion, you'll sting. And the scorpion gave him an eloquent speech of how he would not sting him. They both died. So listen. The frog said, okay. Gets halfway to the middle of the pond, and what happens? The scorpion stings him. The frog looks up before he dies and says, Why did you do that? He goes, I'm a scorpion. I know what I am. Okay, so listen. That is what we are without Christ. We are sinners. And the best of us outside of Christ are nothing more than sinners who need salvation. You need a Savior because you cannot save yourself. There will come a day when you will stand before this righteous and holy God who is perfect in all His ways and who will look at you and not just look at your outside, but He will look <coughs> through you, in you, and know everything that you've done, and will expect an answer for what you've done in this, this life and this body. What are you going to say to that God if Christ isn't standing by your side as an advocate? You can't say anything. Do you understand why you need a Savior? All the days of your life, you need a Savior. Okay, so, now unto the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. How do we glorify God? How do we actually bring Him glory? Isn't it by how Christ is shown in us? Isn't it how the world sees that there's something different about you? You do what you say. You don't steal. You're not cheating on your spouse. You're not going to the bars and drinking and carousing. That there's something different about you. That you used to do that stuff. And you found this Jesus and you don't do it no more. Some people say you're a Jesus freak. You're crazy. What have you done? I enjoyed you more when you used to be fun. <laughs> the world offers you what it calls and deems fun. The older you get, the more you realize that fun is a lie. It never lasts, and there is a heavy price to pay for it. Oh, it's fleeting. It's fleeting. All right, so turn to Matthew 5, 9. We looked at this one already. Matthew 5, 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called what? Let me ask you something. I really think about this. 
If you could trade places and become Bill Gates, have all his money, all that power, or you could be poor, but be a child of God and have that as what's logged in the books of heaven. John Gray, child of God. Which one would you rather have? Uh, see, I, I, I know that's what you're going to say. But see, the difference is that God knows really what's your motive of your heart. Because you can say that, but when you leave here, your motives could be, I want to be as rich as Bill Gates. You know what I'm saying? If I had that kind of money, I would be so much. <laughs> now listen, God is smart and knows what is best for us. To those that can handle much, he may give much. To those, listen. How many of you guys ever heard of the Christian group Audio Adrenaline? I knew you would. Yeah, Audio Adrenaline. Audio Adrenaline has a song called uh, My Chevette. And the guy that sings it and wrote it, his father was a pastor. Okay? And there's a line in there, and, and his father drives up in this brand new Chevette. Now, how many of you guys ever saw a, a Chevette? Yeah. Has anybody ever owned one? No. Yeah, that's right. There's a reason for that. Okay. A Chevette. Now, now this man, he pulls up in the driveway, he's got his family, and, and, and he's a pastor, and this is what he could afford, his Chevette. Now, this boy grew up working with his dad uh, in the ministry in this Chevette. And there's a line in there that said that, you know, his dad was poor. <clears throat> in the eyes of the world, but he was a rich, rich man in the eyes of God. Why? Because he had what truly lasts, a family that loves him, a relationship with God that, and an inheritance that never goes away, can never be tarnished. It's this incorruptible, and that will last throughout all eternity. Bill Gates is going to die at some point in time, is that right? All that money will not allow him to live forever, is that right? So at some point, he's going to die, and all those riches are going to go to somebody else. The inheritance that God has set aside for you will last throughout eternity. Amen. How many of you guys that are retired are worried that your retirement may not last as long as you live? Anybody? So everybody's pretty set here, right? <laughs> Let's say that you're retired for 60 years. That's a long time to be retired, right? 60 years long. Can you imagine having an inheritance that's going to last you 30 billion, trillion, gazillion, whatever? Okay? <coughs> never runs out. You'll never be bored. You'll never be hungry. You'll never be without a house. You will never have more bills than money to pay. You'll never have more months, or no, more bills than months to get everything taken care of. Okay? Don't get so focused on this life that you forget what God has promised you in the life to come. Because if you sell your soul for this life, you're selling yourself cheap. Amen. And I mean cheap. Cheap. Okay. One more. Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Now I want you to know that all these dollar ropes, and I told him that the board wasn't in here. I didn't put anything together because I was going to preach what you wrote. Okay? So the board wasn't in here. It's like, well, this will be a really short sermon today. But luckily, he had it here. He didn't erase it. So listen, Philippians 2, verses 14 and 15. Do all things what? What's murmuring? Say it loud. Complaining. How many of you guys are complainers by heart? At least you're honest. Okay. Yeah, everybody's got both hands up. <laughs> when I was a kid and my mother paid for everything, I didn't complain. <clears throat> when I was a teenager and I really didn't need a whole lot, I didn't complain. But when I had a family and got all that goes with that, house, car, bills, 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 car bills, man, I started to complain. You know what I'm saying? But yet the Bible tells us to do all things without complaining. And what's this next word? 
What's another word for disputing? Arguing. So listen, this is not only advice for how you deal with each other in church, but this is how you should deal with each other in your home. Those of you who are young, marriage is ahead of you. You have to learn this secret. Is that right, right? That's the secret of getting along with somebody that's so totally different from you. And then the more time you're with them, the more time you realize how much different they are. And they have to see the same thing from you. Okay, so how do you bring two people together and have them last a lifetime? You do all things together. without complaining and without arguing. And that when you do argue, you have the safety of knowing you can argue, knowing that your relationship will last forever. Why do you think in the traditional marriage service, in the marriage vow, you promise to love each other for better, for worse, in sickness and in health? What's the last part? So death do you part. Sometimes you wish that comes sooner rather than later. <laughs> Am I the only one that's ever felt that way? No. Seriously. Yeah. God, you, know, you guys have been married for a while, you know that. Understand this. That love that you feel that is so powerful and strong that you just want to talk to each other and be with each other 24 hours a day was never meant to last. That is infatuation. That is not love. Okay? Because believe me, you can see a brand new ring and feel the same way about it. I can see a brand new Mustang, kind of like what your son has. I feel the same way about it, but when I get it, the feeling goes, right? What is love? Love is a commitment that says, I am with you in good and bad, whether you change, whether you stay the same, no matter what happens, I love you. And I'll always be there for you. Because in this life, you have children, at some point they're going to go and they'll start by themselves. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Then who's left? You and him. Right? And so it is you and your wife. And if you guys don't have that bond, that commitment, when those years of raising kids are gone and there's nothing but you and her left, what would you have? All of that you said in your life, your husband. That's where your heart is. Your children, you raise them, your heart was with them, but there comes a point when they leave. But your heart has to be with your husband. And when the kids are here, your heart still has to be with your spouse. Because your kids will leave. And they will leave you. <laughs> so listen. Do you realize that the marriage is what God gave us to give us the closest thing for us to understand how Jesus loves you? Jesus loved you enough to make a commitment to go to the cross. He wasn't infatuated with you. Because infatuation lasts for a short period of time and then it wanes. Right? But love, true committed love, will last a lifetime. So, this is where I close. Do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may be, what? Blameless? Okay. What's this next word? That's a hard one. I can deal with the blameless one, but the harmless one? I have a boys. It's hard to be harmless when you got boys. <laughs> but think about what I'm saying, okay? Has your boss ever hurt your feelings by saying something to you? Has your boss ever had to take you into his office or her office or take you to say, or he may have done it, they may have done it in front of the employees and actually just give it right to you right then because you deserved it because you did something really dumb? So how do you balance all these outs? Oh, here's one. Your kid takes your car. You're 15 years old. They take your car. They wreck it. And the cops have them now. And you know that kid's safer with the cops. I mean, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> and you're so upset that you're flipping through your Bible and you come to Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Do all things without murmuring and disputing, arguing, that you may be blameless and harmless. Huh, what do you think, last of you got kids? <laughs> I give you the example of when my mother, one of the times she had to take me home from the police station. And that was, she didn't have to say a whole lot, she could just look at you. And you just saw the disappointment in her face. And it's like, no, I hate that. And then she would give you the silent treatment. And I say, I'd rather be yelled at. Yeah. Silent treatment. I hate the silent treatment. You have to take what the Word says and you have to work it out in your life, which is why you work out your salvation with what? Fear and trembling. I've told you before, there's a time for tough love. You have a kid that takes your car, he wasn't listening to you when you gave him, you know, the big speech about responsibility, right? So there is a time and a place, as, as uh, Solomon wrote, there's a time and a place for what? Everything. Everything done on this side. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 340. Donald, thank you very much.